I've gotten a lot of comments over the years, some of which I'd rather forget about. But the comment that I get probably the most often is a request to talk about public transportation in small towns and rural areas. Now I'm going to be honest, there are going to be some hard truths in this video, but also some big potential positives. Let's dive in to see how transit can work in some of the least transit friendly places. If you enjoy videos on this channel and you want to help support us for free, consider subscribing and hitting the bell icon. Let's try to get those numbers up. Before we talk about that rail fan dream of beautiful rolling stock rolling through rolling hills, we have to establish something. And that's the fact that public transportation fundamentally needs people to move. You can't just move around sheep all day. If you don't have sufficient population density, it legitimately does become hard to run a viable public transportation service that people will actually want to use. Now, I do think people overestimate how much population density you actually need for good public transit, but you still do need some population density. Now that's not to say that we shouldn't try to provide transportation for rural areas. These regions are in the age of mass urbanization often impoverished and they need that transportation access. At the same time, for people who don't have cars and do live in the majority of the places where people live these days, cities, having transportation access to rural areas is really important for keeping communities vibrant and connected, even when city dwellers don't have cars they can use to drive into the farmlands. Of course, with all of that said, at the same time, more than probably with typical urban transportation services, rural and small town transportation, public transportation that is, is going to be more dependent on the kind of funding you can put together than otherwise would be the case. For normal public transit to make sense, we need to have journeys to serve. And so in the most completely rural areas, it probably doesn't actually make a lot of sense to have a conventional transit service. But this is one place where modern technology can actually come to save us. For remote areas, an on-demand transit option actually seems like a fairly compelling idea. And it all comes down to how you allocate your limited resources. Imagine you have 10 buses to serve a gigantic rural area. Operating fixed routes might mean you can only operate a few fixed routes, meaning some areas will be completely unserved and frequencies will be low, which means that almost all areas will not be served most of the time. With such limited resources, a few fixed routes are almost certainly worse than a more dynamic on-demand network that can adjust based on where major trip flows are happening. You have to also remember that vehicles traveling dynamically from one place to another can take advantage of the fact that speeds can typically be higher in low density rural areas. I'd say an option like this with modern automatic vehicle location systems and routing algorithms that are available to public transportation agencies, the dynamic routing and on-demand transit services, particularly in very low density places, can actually be pretty attractive. Now, sometimes people don't like the idea of an on-demand transportation service because when they demand for a trip, they may have to wait, you know, 20, 30, 40 minutes. But you have to remember that in a giant rural area that has incredibly low densities, you're probably going to be lucky to see hourly regular service on fixed routes. And so a 40 minute or 30 minute wait is actually pretty good, especially since the trip will probably take you fairly directly to your destination. It's also important to remember that even in modern rural areas, employment tends to be incredibly decentralized and often it's just at home doing agricultural work. And this means the idea of planning a service around a peak orientation where a lot of people move at rush hour and not that many outside of that is just not how you should be planning a rural area transit service. It needs to be an anywhere to anywhere all day sort of affair that allows people to go meet up with family and friends or go to a store if they need to or go to a medical appointment, which can be a big reason in itself to connect up rural areas with public transportation since access to medical care can often be very limited. Of course, you might also want to connect to intercity transit and let's get into that. Now, it might surprise you, but I think long distance transit services can be incredibly practical for serving rural and low density areas. And this has to do with having a low incremental cost when you're already serving adjacent areas. If you have a rural area that's near a larger metropolis or between two cities, it can be pretty easy to stop some regular number of trains or buses at the rural area to provide good access. And the incremental cost of this typically isn't that high, since you can just stop a reasonable amount of vehicles to provide that local service. Even just one or two vehicles a day can be a complete game changer, allowing access where it didn't exist before. Of course, this can also be a great way to compensate rural areas and small towns for the disbenefits of playing host to something like a major rail corridor or something else. 
Rural areas and small towns are also a great place to build something like a train maintenance facility or right-of-way maintenance facility or control centers because land costs tend to be low and it can provide a lot of good jobs for the local population. The usefulness of stops in rural areas and small towns also often does come down to urban planning, even though these areas aren't necessarily what you always think of when you think of urban places. I think the concept of new towns in particular is really valuable here. A, a new town is essentially a transit-oriented development or style of planning where you try to center things around a public transportation station. These typically include mixes of uses centered around your railway station, most likely in this case. That includes things like shops, schools, and places for people to live, and usually density ramps up as you get closer to the station. There are a ton of different benefits to this type of development model, and it's been seen in lots of different parts of the world. The first huge benefit is that people often don't even need to use public transportation. If they live in these new town type areas, they can typically walk or cycle to almost anything they'd want to do on a regular basis. This reduces the need for difficult to justify transit, but also allows transit resources to be used where they're really, really needed. It's also important to remember that by centralizing a lot of things around, say, a railway station, you also make trips for people who don't live in the adjacent new town area, but in the larger rural area, much easier. Because people can simply travel to the railway station, which is naturally a good place to connect to your public transit network, and then they can do all of their appointments, see friends and family, and potentially go to something like a store all at once. I've personally spent a lot of my life actually living in rural areas, and one of the most difficult things that forces you into car dependency is the fact that things aren't centralized. Going to a shop or going to a school often means going in completely different directions and making long trips from one place to another to another back home. Centralizing everything means that even if you do have to travel a decent distance to the railway station, the new town, whatever we're calling it, you at least then get to benefit from the centralization. Of course, there's also some more serious issues you need to consider when it comes to providing this public transportation, walkability, and cyclability to people in small towns and rural areas. And that's the fact that driving under the influence tends to be a much larger issue in these areas. Why? Probably in large part because people just don't have options the same way they do in cities. Now, given the geographical size of a lot of these regions, having vehicles go directly to or even fairly close to most people's homes can often be difficult. And while centralizing around railway stations and new town type developments is useful, it doesn't help people who do truly live in rural areas. And this is a great reason to seriously encourage and help foster bike use. This widens out the catchment area for public transit services and also your new town from several hundred meters to several kilometers, which is a massive growth. At the same time, building high quality cycling infrastructure can be incredibly inexpensive and efficient if you're doing it in a well-planned way. Of course, cycling infrastructure can also be useful in its own right. If someone's just trying to go see a neighbor who's a few kilometers away, they can just ride their bike there fairly easily and not need to rely on public transportation. Again, living in a rural area myself, I can personally attest to how difficult cycling around was, often because the only provision for cycling was a narrow shoulder on a rural road. And while the low density of people traveling around on the roads might seem like that makes using the road completely practical as a cyclist, people tend to drive really fast on rural roads. And while that's a problem, it's something that's kind of hard to enforce. Of course, small policy measures like this can make serving rural areas and small towns much more practical with public transportation, but land use is also really important. Even just encouraging people to build their houses closer to roadways can make a huge difference in how attractive riding a bike or public transportation or walking can be. You'll see that in a lot of rural areas, people tend to build homes or other things far away from the roadway, and the issue with this is that it means there's a long built-in walk just to get to the road, much less go anywhere else, and that's a huge problem. It's also important to consider connecting up different roadways and forming a cohesive transportation network. So often, someone who wants to travel in a rural area will be forced to go the long way around because they would otherwise have to cross big fences or people's property that isn't theirs. And from my personal experience, people in rural areas do sometimes have weapons for, you know, pests and the like, and so it's generally not great to be trespassing. And so having things like cycling routes and public paths that cut across large areas so that people traveling from one population center can travel to another safely walking or cycling is really valuable. Now, assuming we're talking about more of a small town than a completely rural area, and there are enough resources for fixed routes, or perhaps given you have a mixed region with some towns and some mixed in rural areas, you should probably approach your public transportation design a bit differently. I think a great model for areas where fixed routes can be supported, but they're at low frequencies is pulse scheduling. 
That way, if people do have to make transfers, and they most likely will need to if you have more than one route, they can at least conveniently transfer. If you're not familiar, a pulse schedule is just where you have buses or trains arrive at a central station or at any number of stations at the same time, meaning that as your bus arrives from one route, another bus from another route arrives, and you can easily transfer between the two vehicles. This can also be really well integrated with, say, an intercity bus or train timetable. So everything is really nicely synchronized. And if you're making a long distance journey, it's just as seamless. One of the nice things about having a rural area where you may not have a ton of buses or trains if you're lucky, is that you actually have the ability to coordinate such a system, since delaying every bus by maybe a minute so that the pulse works properly is probably fine. At the same time, you should also pursue clock phase scheduling. This typically comes with a pulse network, but what it means is that vehicles depart at a consistent time every hour. So maybe at the hour and the 30 minute mark, or more frequently at the hour, 15, 30, and 45 minute marks to make things really consistent and so that you don't need to look at a schedule to know when you need to show up at your bus stop. Of course, frequency is really valuable, but in rural areas, it can sometimes be hard to justify running that many vehicles, especially since many vehicles will run with very light passenger loads. And so this is a great alternative that doesn't necessarily require frequency. I talked about it more in my frequency is great, but it isn't everything video. You can go check that out. Now, as within true rural areas, even in small towns, fixed route transit services will see a lot of benefits. One of the big ones is that you typically will have more reliable trip times and faster trip times overall, since vehicles can typically travel faster through lower density areas. The ability to travel fast is underrated because it means that you can operate higher frequencies with lower amounts of vehicles. The frequency of a route really just depends on how quickly a vehicle can travel along the whole route. And so the faster you can travel, the more frequency you can deliver with a limited vehicle fleet. It's also worth considering that if your small town or rural area has a lot of money, that you can consider doing things like reducing the operating expenses of your routes by doing things like electrification via a mixture of trolley electric and battery electric buses that can serve a potentially dense core or nodes of your network and can travel on battery in between those nodes in rural areas. Investing in reducing operating expenses when you have that extra money is really valuable because it means that you can weather the storms of times when economic hardship come. It also means you have to invest in renewing your fleet much less often, since buses that are electric and trains that are electric for that matter can last way longer than their fossil fuel powered counterparts. Small towns by their very nature have a lot of potential to grow as well. And so I think it's really important, but also valuable to plan them in a way that allows transit to remain competitive and be the best option as they continue to grow. One huge thing here is setting aside corridors for future transit construction, which is something we've seen in places like Ottawa and Calgary. Among other things, this can make building busways and even future rail systems way simpler and also much less expensive over time compared to building new rapid transit above or below ground. It's also just a great way to generally address our construction cost issues, but it requires the foresight that you might want a future transit system. And if you decide you do, it's pretty easy to set aside the room for two tracks or two lanes for buses. Now, I will say that the idea that you should plan for rapid transit and just transit in general more broadly and from the beginning and in the development process of a small town is really important. Planning your growth carefully and keeping development compact reduces your need for transportation and for transit in general. At the same time, providing the infrastructure for transit and cycling allows people to have different mobility choices from day one, and including multiple mobility options and the infrastructure that supports them can help ingrain non-car travel early. Sometimes sprawl does feel inevitable, and if you must sprawl, try to do so linearly. The benefit of this versus a more blob style of development or islands of density in a rural area is that a linear corridor is much easier to serve with public transportation and other transportation options since you can create a single high quality corridor down the middle and serve most of the area well. The smallest region in North America with a tram system, Waterloo region, benefited from almost exactly this. Being able to build a single line, a tram line in this case, that's able to serve almost all of the major destinations in one foul swoop. As a mixed urban and rural region, one of the ways that this project was sold was also, in my personal opinion, quite smart. There was naturally opposition to building a tram in an urban and rural region from rural dwellers who felt that this was an expensive urban indulgence. But the way that this was sold was that it would help protect farmland by keeping urban development compact and reducing the need for sprawl, which if we're honest is pretty awesome. A good example of this is the rapid bus in Kelowna, British Columbia a city far away from metropolitan centers that only has around 120,000 people, and yet has a high quality BRT light corridor running straight through the middle of it. 
The line has nice high quality shaded shelters with next bus arrival screens and other nice amenities that you might see in a much bigger city. It also features basic road amenities like some dedicated bus lanes and queue jumps to help keep things running smoothly. And the nice thing about a system like this, BRT Lite in general, is that it can easily be scaled up into a 24-hour rapid transit system that could help connect people from the major university in the Kelowna area to its downtown core in the future. In the future as well, the nice thing about this corridor is that as Kelowna continues to grow, short spurs from this mainly linear corridor could also serve the airport of the city as well as the largest hospital in the general region, which is a great destination to connect as I mentioned before. Given Kelowna's growth, such a system could also naturally be upgraded into light rail or even a light metro system like you see in a city like Brescia. And this shows the value about development mainly around a single linear corridor, if a corridor that is still too car dependent. And ultimately, even though buses are unfortunately looked down upon by many public transportation supporters, I think systems that can only rely on buses are kind of great. They can invest in nicer buses, they can have easier 24-hour service that instead of substituting rail lines for buses just runs the same service 24 hours a day, and new bus options have allowed for things like zero emissions vehicles and larger capacities. It's pretty cool. It's also important to remember that when long distance travel is necessary, high frequencies are simply going to be more difficult. And that's because of long travel times, which is why quality and reliability are such important things to focus on on lower frequency systems. Fundamentally, as you develop, focusing on reducing car dependency and maintaining a low degree of car dependency is critical. Make people car dependent and you won't build the ridership group for transit. At the same time, you'll face a ton of political headwinds anytime you try to expand space or funds for public transportation, and every decision either brings you closer to the former or the latter. Ultimately, there's no reason a rural area or a small town can't ultimately be made friendly for people who don't want to drive. And in some cases, it's even easier than with large cities. Thanks for watching.